He's been called the greatest Canadian, the most trusted Canadian, even the sexiest Canadian. But around here, we just call him Suzuki, David Suzuki, the host of The Nature of Things. He's certainly the country's best known environmentalist, one who hasn't been shy about his activism on that front. You don't mess with air. Have we so polluted our environment, we've got to buy water? What does it take to get any kind of actual action? Please come and see us. We're very happy. You don't have to believe me, just look at history. In a few days, he turns 80. Time to reflect on what he's accomplished so far. And that's just what we did when we sat down to talk about his latest milestone. So what does 80 feel like? I don't like to think about it. My kids look at me and say, Dad, you're so old, you know? And uh, it's weird know, because you know, I don't feel, old. I don't, I well, don't no, this old. is what 80 looks like, but uh, no, it's all. Uh, 80 can often look a lot <laughs> older than that. But I, have you ever been fixated on birthdays? I mean, no, people I've, go through the sort of turning 30, turning 40, yeah, 50, no, 60. No, Even, no, that's it's never, never been, been a, a big deal. 60 was nothing, 70 was nothing. But this, you got to admit, you know, you're in, I always say I'm in the death zone and everybody gets, oh, God, don't say that. But this is the last part of your life. But I, my message is that this is the most important time in my life because I don't have to run after a job or a promotion or a raise. So I'm really free. I don't have to kiss anybody's ass. I can say the truth that comes from my heart. And uh, if that always, offends... <laughs> have you, you've always done that, have you not? Yeah, that's true. It's got me into a lot of trouble in the past, though. But it, that's what makes Suzuki, isn't it? <laughs> it it's different. I don't like pissing people off, but... Uh, uh, yeah, my dad always gave me a very strong sense that if you want everybody to like you, you're not going to stand for anything. Because whatever you stand for, there'll always be people that, uh, that object. For centuries, scientists have been a small band of people dedicated to the pursuit of truth in relative seclusion from the rest of the public. With the explosion of the atomic bomb, however, the dream of scientific innocence vanished. And scientists and technologists began to become aware of the fact that their work affected human beings in very severe ways. Let's focus on, on your passions, and that is obviously your concern for the environment, uh, which has been a, a passion all your life? Well, if it, I never thought of it in terms of an issue. I just was born to be outside because my earliest memories are going camping with my dad. And I, that's what I've tried to do with all my children is get them out into nature. It's just a part of who we are. Now, you know, I had been moved to in issues in Vancouver during the 60s after uh, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. And I think of Rachel Carson as the, the, the mother of the environmental movement. Because up until then, we thought technology was great. You know, the guy that, uh, Paul Mueller, who showed that DDT kills insects, won a Nobel Prize in 1948. But it really was a decade later, people began to say, geez, something funny is going on. It's, uh, the eagles are disappearing. And that's when Rachel Carson put it together and said the birds are going quiet because they're disappearing, that we began to realize the interconnectedness of everything. What bothers me is that in a, in a world that's becoming extremely complex, in which the environment in, in many ways is being ravished very rapidly, rather than trying to recover our good environment, our clean air and clean water and so on, we may begin to say, well, let's adapt man to the noxious gases in the air and the dirty water. Let's start tampering with his, his basic makeup and adapt him. And that's a very dangerous thing, I think. Overall, are we better off than we were when you began in this passion in the early 60s? No, I mean, hundreds of thousands of species are no longer exist. Uh, the forests have been entered. There's only like 20% of the real old growth left around the planet. Uh, the air is, and water and land are filled with toxic chemicals that we've invented. I mean, no, the, I know that my grandchildren have nothing like the opportunity to live in the world that I knew and you knew as, as when we were children. 
So, so what does that say to you then? Well, it says how, how we've struggle? fundamentally failed as environmentalists. Many of our so-called victories 30 years ago, we stopped, for example, yesterday morning, I was, uh, I was on the steps of the BC courthouse objecting to uh, a plan to evict uh, protesters uh, against a dam at Site C on the Peace River. 30 years ago, we fought that same battle and won, we thought, and here it is back again. We stopped a dam in uh, Altamira in Brazil after a huge effort, and uh, that dam is now being built by the Brazilian government 30 years later. So these victories were really pirate victories because we haven't fundamentally changed the way we see ourselves in the world. Three or four years ago, I got a call from the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the tar sands. He said, could I come and see you? I said, of course, would love to see you. I'm not into fighting. So he came the next day and I said, thank you for coming, I'm so grateful. But before you come in the door, do me a big favor, leave your identity as a CEO outside. <laughs> I want you to meet me man to man as a human being because I don't see the point in negotiating if we don't both fundamentally agree on what our great needs are. So did, did he check out uh, you know, <clears throat> that part of his corporate self? And if he did, what did you check well, out? See, he came in, well, he, he reluctantly, he had come down as the CEO of right. an oil company. And he, you know, he's always gonna be that. And, but, but I asked him not to let that interfere with right. a discussion. And I said, look, I know this is difficult, what do you think is the most important thing every human being needs? Well, I could see he's kind of thinking money, a job. Uh, and I said, you know, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So surely you would agree with me, the greatest need we have is for clean air. For so how is he water. reacting to this when you're saying this? In the end, he could not shake hands with me. He could agreed. not? No. Because it was an unfair situation. He had come down as a CEO of an oil company to negotiate. If he were to go back to his shareholders and say, well, I had a conversation with Suzuki and I agree with him. Whatever we do, we must not compromise the air, the water, or the soil because they're what keep us alive and healthy. He'd be fired in a flash. That's not his job. So his job is to make money for his shareholders. And so long as we remain in that, in that uh, confine, defined by economics, we're gonna lose every time. The threats of global warming range from the relative inconvenience of needing an air conditioner to catastrophic floods and fires. But as scientists all over the world examine the impacts of what seems like a small increase in the planet's average temperature, a picture of global disruption of geography and biodiversity is emerging that will profoundly alter life on Earth. Let me take you back to your words a, little, a few minutes ago when you said as environmentalists we failed. That must be a really difficult thing for you to have to admit after all these years fighting on that issue. Well, failed? We've, you know, what we did, of course there were great successes, when Rachel Carson's book came out in 1962, there wasn't a Department of the Environment in any government on the planet. But fundamentally, our problem is that humans now do not see themselves as a part of the biosphere and utterly dependent on it. And it's that perception that indigenous people around the world have when they say, the earth is our mother. They don't mean that poetically or metaphorically. They mean it literally that we are created out of the most fundamental elements of the biosphere, the air, the water, the soil. And so we owe it to Mother Earth to take care of her for our own benefit. And we haven't made that shift. We have not made that fundamental shift. On the issue of climate change, there is still a substantial number of Canadians, upwards of 40%, who feel that climate change, if it's happening at all, isn't happening has nothing because to do of, with us. has nothing to do with us. Now that must seem like a failure. Well, it uh, certainly reveals the, uh, the world that we live in. We now know that Exxon has known for over 10 years through its own scientists 
that climate change is being caused by the use of fossil fuels. So that company for over 10 years has spent tens of millions of dollars supporting groups to say this is junk science. This is, and it's worked. I mean, Sounds like the cigarette issue all over again. And many of the people that are involved in denial of climate change were working at one time for the tobacco industry. Same techniques. But some energy companies, you got to concede, have a, a, are, are at least now on the, the same side as you in the sense uh. of, of, of human involvement in, in the, uh, what's contributing to the changes in climate. Are they? Well, are they not? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to know which ones. Well, I don't I'm, know of any company that has really come out and said, this is something we've got to do. Because basically, if they admit that fossil fuels are at the heart of it, they really have to say, uh, we got to get out of this business. And I keep saying, you guys are energy companies. You're not oil companies, you're energy companies. Surely uh, you can make that transition to what has to be the energy of the future. But when they spend billions of dollars, which they do, on trying to have cleaner emissions, is that not an acceptance or an admission in, in some fashion that they are in oh, fact well, it, yeah, okay. if, if causing a problem? I hope so. I, ho I hope you're right. I hope that is an admission. Well, why what else it, would they do? Well, I, because they're dragged to, to do it by government action. They're made to do it. And it's like the CEO of a forestry company once when I, we were fighting against clear-cut logging. He said, listen, everything we do is within the letter of the law. You don't like what we do? Your argument is with the government. And, it, and he was right. Clear-cut logging on a vast scale was allowed by the government. So in terms of government, if they begin to say, well, you've got to be more efficient in, in the way that you extract energy, that's great. But the, the ultimate truth is we have to leave most of it in the ground. Is it, is it too late on climate change? There are many people now of my colleagues who are saying it's too late. And Where, it's, what are you saying? I'm saying we don't know enough to say it's too late. It's very, very late. But there's no what point. What don't we know? Well, we don't know whether there are, are consequences of the high concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. We know that it's dissolving in the oceans as carbonic acid and acidifying the oceans, which is terrible. But it may, I don't know, there might be some compensatory response of all the green things to suddenly become super carbon eaters. I don't know. I just don't think we know at this point to say it's too late. But um, it is very, very late. Still to come, this stage in your life, what are you worried about? Well, I, I worry about, uh, I think about death a lot. Science is always double-edged. Discoveries have the potential to be either good or to be abused in ways that may be harmful. We have to ask questions like who is going to control these discoveries? How are they going to be applied? Who is going to decide that which is good for us or those things that are bad? How do you deal with the critics who attack you personally? Well, because I, there are many who come after you for all sorts of different reasons to try to um, well, undermine your position. It's, uh, it's been a long haul in terms of, of critics. I mean. Uh, I've been told not to go into certain towns in British Columbia when it, we had the heat of the forestry battles, but those things you have to take as not attacks on who I am. They're simply attempts to deflect dealing with the message by s shooting the messenger. This is the most effective way of not dealing with the issue itself, by saying you're full of crap, you know, like, who can believe you? You lie all the time or, or whatever. And then all the responsibility is on the messenger saying, I don't lie, I don't, you know, prove it. And, and you get caught up without ever dealing with the issue. But uh, they these things... you for flying around. Yes. For, and know, I was... Probably for I was, having come into Toronto. I was standing at the... Uh, urinal in the Calgary airport and the guy said, I hope you flew in on, an, on a, a solar uh, airplane because otherwise you're a goddamn hypocrite. Well, you know, my point is it's true that none of us lives the way we're going to have to live in a really carbon constrained world. But right now the important thing is talking about what we can do about it, the solutions and convincing people we've got to do it. But there are those kinds on both sides of the argument, right? I mean, you talk about the trolls who are just looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see those on the other side, yeah, too. Yeah. 
on your side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, in fact, one of the guys who's going around, he's a professor, American, saying it's too late, and he's put a date on when we're all going to be gone, which is not within my lifetime, but uh, my kids. I finally handled what he was saying by realizing the people who deny the reality of climate change cherry pick the data. They look for little bits and pieces and construct a, a, a story. You know, all the climatologists are lying, and uh, what about sunspots here? And uh, they create this story. But this fellow is doing the same thing. He's cherry picking the worst indications and putting together a really frightening story. To talk about the world 50 years or 100 years from now is absolutely insane. We can't even conceive of what the world will be like in 50 years. I can barely try to project 10 years from now. Will we survive the next 20 years? And then a far more important question. If we do, will it be worth it? Will the world of 20 years from now be sufficiently good to merit wanting to live any longer? And I will say, uh, as one person, not as a scientist, but as one individual, that if we continue the way we're living now, the world in 20 years will not be worth living. This stage in your life, what do you worry about? Well, I, I worry about, uh, I think about death a lot. Really? Yeah, and uh, just because I know it's in the last time, I know that we don't have the time to really make the change in terms of the way we perceive the world. When you say you, you, you worry about death, what do you think about when you well, think about I, that? I want, I want not to suffer. I, I would hope that I will still have my faculties. My mother had Alzheimer's for over five years, and my father was magnificent in the way he took care of her, but it was very, very tough. He died in a, a great way that we were all there. His family, uh, he was completely aware, ready for death. And uh, that's how I would like to, to see it done. To be able to just say to my kids, look, I'm just one person. Don't expect me to, to make the difference or be the, the critical. But as one person, I tried my best. And I know there are millions of people around the world all trying their best. I heard a story once of, about you being asked how you wanted to be remembered and you kind of shot back like who cares yeah I, i'm not gonna be around to exactly know, to know how I'm exactly remembered. the reporter said what do you want people to say about you after you're gone i, I couldn't believe the question i said i'll be dead who cares <laughs> <laughs> like you know the, those kinds of things are for the living but i don't care but you kind of answered it a moment ago when you said that you tried yes that that i did do my best and that's all anybody can do. We're all fallible, you know, human beings with all of our foibles and, and problems. Ask my kids, they'll tell you all the things to criticize me about. I'm a human being, but I did the best I could.